Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I'm Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Um, so I don't know where to start. Uh, Let's start with the fact that you're wearing a Jack Daniels shirt, yet you have no drink. Um, <laughs> well, I have a Jack Daniels shirt on because uh, this is kind of a throwaway shirt. Ah, I, just I'm like not, Jack Daniels, right? I'm, I'm not actually a big fan. Yeah, I, I'm aware. <laughs> I mean, I went to college, so I've had more than my share of Jack and Cokes. Yeah. Uh, but then I, you know, drank other things and realized right. that when it comes down to it, Jack Daniels kind of sucks. It's not. It's not. It's not a premier whiskey or bourbon. No, as it were. It's not a bourbon at all. No. Yeah. yeah. What is it then? It's Tennessee whiskey. Tennessee whiskey. No, so they have their own classification then. Yeah, there is, there's a different. Um, I think the main difference is actually how it's filtered. Okay. Because uh, they do the charcoal filtering. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that's kind of the distinctive feature. There's only a few Tennessee whiskeys. And like George Dickel would be the other big one. Yeah. Uh, I did, you know, when I started to get kind of pedantic about it, I did get irritated when I would go into places and ask for a bourbon and they would say, Jack Daniels, okay? And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's education time. <laughs> it's not even a bourbon. <laughs> Um, but I, I try not to push that anymore. What are you drinking anyway? <laughs> I grabbed the Russells. Okay. Well, you're drinking it out of a Jack Daniels glass, I see. I am. That is a glass I have to hand wash, by the way. <laughs> I like it because it's small. It's not a big, fat glass because I only poured a small drink. Yeah. So. Well, it's got gold leaf, so I can't throw it in the washing machine. Washing, yeah, dishwasher. Uh, I like the size of it. Well, um, I, I'm glad you got what you liked. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It got yeah. ice and everything, man. Yeah. Well, I'm not drinking because I have not been well for yeah. like a while now, it seems like. Um, uh, I was going to so. say, yeah, we were kind of lucky to record tonight. Yeah, um, I they they gave me a new pill that's kind of working. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, I definitely know when it wears off, though. It, apparently, oh, really? <laughs> it lasts about six hours, apparently. Cause, wow. <laughs> um, I took one at like 8 o'clock last night, and then I woke up about 2.30 this morning just hurting. No, no. Um, so. Ah. Oh, well. Ah. But it's a start. I, at I'd least only been taking it for a day, so. Maybe it's just going to take a while to build up in your system yeah. and, and get going. Yeah. Start healing you. Yeah, yeah, let's hope it does that. <laughs> um, so I guess, uh, all right, so been getting some questions here and there about why we're not addressing the impeachment stuff. Ah, yes. and, and the short answer is because there is no impeachment. Yeah, you know, I watched some stuff today on it. There's just, it's they're not there yet as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well, they haven't done anything. Like Nothing their is- official start their resolution that's supposedly the official start of the impeachment it's not a start of impeachment it, yeah. it has no legal bearing whatsoever and so that's why and I, I don't know if bolton showed up today nobody really expected him to but um, what they keep saying in the news and i imagine they'll say this about him if he didn't show today also is that these uh, you know people that are backing the president are ignoring subpoenas <laughs> uh but it's not a subpoena yeah. It's it's a request to show up, and the reason it's not a subpoena, just a request to show up, is because there is no impeachment. Yeah, oh, that, they they haven't voted, and that's that, I've been saying this from the beginning. If they want to do this, they need to do it. They need to put it to a vote and mm-hmm. and do. It. And I think they're going to. I mean, I think in the next week or so, we'll see. I mean, I think in the next week or so we'll see. They're supposed to have public hearings next week. And so there will actually be something to talk about when they have some public hearings, when we can actually hear from these people and see what they have to say. Mm-hmm. But if it's if it's no more than what we already know now, mm-hmm. there's just nothing there. It's just theater. Um, yeah. They don't want to actually bring impeachment proceedings against the president. I think that it would be far more damaging to the Democrats, to the Democrats than it is to the Republicans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, well, because like, it's not going anywhere. They're going to have to have some serious, real something mm-hmm. to actually follow through with an impeachment, to actually impeach the president. Yeah, uh, it's some of the other stuff that's come up that I that I do find a little bit interesting about it. Um, I mean, one, just like this, like this basic idea that, uh, it, the, that there's a problem, even if 
if true, yeah. that there is a problem with um, uh, Trump asking a leader of a foreign government to do an investigation into an American citizen. Yeah. Well, the, we know that that's not a problem. I mean, that's the yeah. thing that happens all the time. So really what the issue is, is that it's Joe Biden. That it's a campaign rival. That's, right. that's the language they keep using on the news. It's yeah. Investigation into a campaign rival. So it brings us to something else, I think, too, and that's the – so we were talking about um, equality a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And I was saying the, the whole idea of equality is just a pipe dream in and of itself. There is, there's no equality to strive for. And I want to amend that a little bit because that's not entirely true. Um, I think that if you're looking for any kind of equality, it's going to be equality under the law, like yeah. judicial equality, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, or, or equality of justice, or I don't. Uh, I don't know that justice is a real meaningful term not, either. Not but, so much, but but under the law, I think is a good way to put it. Yeah. Like I mean, the legal system should be equal for everybody. And um, I would contend that if you want that, if you want economic equality too, but yeah. um, if you want judicial equality, that um, that a growing government is a counter to that. Yeah. That uh, the growing government uh, exacerbates any kind of inequality. And and yeah. I would say that this is a really good example of that. Yeah. Um, because what they're saying here is that uh, once somebody becomes a politician that is in play in any way, that they can no longer be investigated for any wrongdoing. Yeah. That there's some kind of problem with that. Um, and, and what what happens in a growing government in terms of judicial equality is that you end up with a political elite who the roles, rules don't apply to. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that this is an example of that. And I, I find it particularly interesting in light of current events worldwide um, when we're looking at uh, that uh, Ukraine specifically is having trouble with corruption. And that's actually what a lot of this was about. Yeah. I mean, based on the testimony that I read, not heard, because they haven't you know, They're released any of it. This yeah. is another thing, by the way. If you're going to have an impeachment inquiry, whatever that means, yeah. doing it behind closed doors and then leaking the information that you think <laughs> is appropriate for yeah. people to understand is really a poor way of doing it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it actually just adds to the idea that this is all just a show. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't give you any kind of sense that there's any kind of justice being done at all. Yeah. It sounds like secret courts and all the scary stuff that we don't like about governments to begin with. Yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, the the issue actually at hand, it seems to be most of the time, the quid pro quo was, yeah. we'll give you this money, but you've got to root out corruption. Like, that's the thing that keeps coming up. Yeah. Um, and... And Joe Biden or Hunter Biden is like the example that the president keeps going back to. But yeah. what the actual issue is, is we want you to, to root out corruption in your government. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I would say that that's also the, the issue that's going on with all these protests in, uh, in Iraq right now, is that they're complaining about corruption in their government. Yeah. And I do want to point out that these two places are two places that we active the US government yeah. actively overthrew the existing government and put the current government in place essentially. <laughs> and now the people are or at least in Iraq the people are rising up against that government. Yeah. And and I I look in fact I saw today in, in at least in reference to Iraq, like it's the young people that are in the streets. Mm -hmm. It's it's not because they don't have any prospects. Yeah. And that's and that's they were interviewing doing just kind of man on the street like while during these protests and stuff, and that's exactly what you said is what the what they were saying. They were like, "Look, yeah, I've got no future. Yeah, with the way things stand here, mm -hmm. and and we want to do something about it. And that's the only thing they know to do. Yeah. Um, and, so. and that's what happens. I mean, it takes it it takes some time. They pointed it out in the uh, um in the Declaration of Independence that yeah. uh, people are are more prone to suffer. Ills while ills are sufferable. I can't remember exactly what the language is, but yeah. but it takes a lot before people are ready to actually revolt in yeah. any kind of active way. Yeah. Um, but so, once they do, it's it's no holes bar. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. Um, I mean, it's the same kind of thing with like uh, to draw a, a, know, kind of a nasty parallel. I'd I'd say it, like suicide. Yeah. Um, you know, when you have to, when people are, are complaining and down and depressed and so forth, you don't have to worry about them so much until they start with the idea that there's nothing for them. 
Yeah. That there's nothing left. Yeah. That they don't, you know, that they don't feel like there's any future, that there's no prospects, there's nothing they can do. When they when they start giving up in that way, that's when you have to start worrying about people. Yeah. And I, I think that it's the same kind of feeling that um, with people that have that blame an outside source really that leads yeah. to this kind of revolt. Yeah. Um, but you know, the point being that these two governments that we've created clearly both have real problems with corruption. That we did not create these wonderful, free, democratic, prosperous nations that we are trying to. Yeah. And that maybe that should give us some pause before we try and do it elsewhere. Yeah. Like start thinking about what the results of our interventions are. Well, because you can't you can't create that. It has to happen organically. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't force democracy or something like that on another country. Yeah. I mean it just it, it doesn't work. I mean think about the history that led to this country founding itself as the republic that it finally did. Yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't just it wasn't just people living here for a couple hundred years under British rule either. Yeah. I mean, it was... Uh, in fact, I would say, I, I would recommend, I think I have before, but I, I would recommend go to YouTube, look up Chris Ann Hall, um, and what's the genealogy of the Constitution. Mm. And uh, like we saw this lecture live, and it was fantastic. Oh, man. Uh, Amazing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, she goes back into the, you know, something like 800 years of history of common law and various um, written agreements between the people and the government in uh, Great Britain that yeah. who, you know, these ideas were developing over time. Yeah. And it took a long time for people to move out of this monarchical way of thinking. And the United States was was a brand new thing. Yeah. And they kind of, because that's in the lecture, that's kind of what she leads to in the end is that we, you know, they took all of this knowledge and all of these experiments that had happened in these different places and put it all together. Yeah. And, and I mean, it was really the first time that had ever been done. Mm-hmm. And it was only, I mean, you, you only have a few hundred years of a natural law and natural rights tradition. Yeah. Um, that's a big part of the, of the foundation of our constitution. Yeah. Um, these things happened over time and it took people's experiences and um, history to lead to what, what this became. Yeah. And so you can't take people out of history and make the, make it happen. Like, oh, yeah. well, we figured out this thing. Like, you guys should just do it our way. Yeah. Well, maybe their way of thinking about the world it hasn't. They're not there. Isn't yet. in the same stage, you yeah. know. Yeah. And I don't mean that as an and kind of a progressive idea in that. Oh well, we're more politically evolved than people in the Middle East or whatever. Yeah. They're just coming from a different point of view. Yeah. Well, we, our experiences are different from theirs. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and and their cultures are different, and that that has a lot to do with it too. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. So. Um. Wow, we got. Way down the rabbit hole there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we start, that started with impeachment. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's just not much to say about yeah. the impeachment. I, and actually, like going back to the idea that um, that you can't investigate Biden because he's a candidate now. Like it, yeah. it doesn't matter any wrongdoing that he did in the past. Um, yeah. He's a candidate now, so you can't look into it. And I know that the idea here is that well, he's a rival candidate. Um, at the same time. I don't know if you remember back when we were talking about um, Venezuela, the, like really kind of at the beginning of this podcast. We spent yeah. a lot of time talking about Venezuela because that was the that was big the thing, thing of the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's still going on, but we're not as actively involved. It seems we kind of gave up on the idea of, of throwing out, uh, of getting <laughs> at least getting Guaido in power. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the reporters that I was looking at a lot during that time, because he was he was down there and he was involved, and he was down there uh, reporting on the situation on the ground in Venezuela. He was also spending time up here at the uh, Venezuelan embassy, um, and uh, that's Max Blumenthal is his yeah. name. Really good writer. I I, I like his stuff. Um, but he was recently charged with assault for some activity with no witnesses, essentially that happened um, while he was defending the Venezuelan embassy here in the U.S. Really? Um, and, like, one of the protesters outside that was preventing food from entering the embassy and all this stuff says that he hit her or something like that. Hmm. Um, that he and some other guy yeah. uh, had gone down to, to try and get food in, and she was trying to prevent them, and, and they hit her and brought food in or something. Now, <laughs> yeah. again, like I said, no witnesses, etc. This yeah. kind of seems like a... Like a retaliatory thing from some protester that just wants to, 
you know, Stir cause some damage, yeah, yeah in, in some other way. Well, you know, I, we're, this is kind of drawing back. But here's the thing. So he's being charged with assault, but you're for this thing that may or may not have happened, while yeah. he was defending the Venezuelan embassy in the U.S., which is the responsibility of the U.S. State Department actually say. to defend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And they weren't doing it. Yeah. And so the people at the State Department who either weren't doing their jobs or gave the order for people not doing their jobs, they're not liable in any way, apparently. Yeah. you got this political elite government employees who aren't being charged with any kind of uh, crime for what was definitely a crime for absolutely intentionally <laughs> refusing to uphold their responsibilities to defend the Venezuelan embassy in the U.S. Meanwhile, this reporter who was up there trying to help get food into the embassy to, to break essentially a siege of the U- of the Venezuelan embassy here, he's yeah. being charged with assault. That's insane. Um, so, like, there's already this real divide between the the political elite and and their culpability yeah. not their culpability but how they're uh, how they're held accountable their accountability yeah and other people hmm. um and uh so you know this is th- and and this is actually kind of one of one of these other things that the impeachment stuff has brought out i don't know if you saw this um this video from the C-SPAN event where John McLaughlin and uh, ah, John Brennan yes. um, were answering questions, I guess, essentially. And the moderator uh, says something to uh, to former – now, these are both former CIA directors. Yep, yep. Um, and they said something to John McLaughlin about the Trump impeachment and uh, doesn't this reinforce Trump's um, narrative about the deep state trying to take him out? And so forth. And he replies, like, quote, thank God for the deep state. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just go right on out and admits it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he goes on to say, you know, these are like good people just trying to uphold their duty and blah, blah, blah. And I, so I have a question about why are, are these people like he's talking about the uh, military officers and government employees and the intelligence community and saying, you know, look, at these are the people that are coming out uh, against this and, and calling yeah. out this wrongdoing. Yeah. Well, which is kind of questionable, I think, to begin this with. And my questions are, you know, what makes these people inherently more trustworthy or deserving of more respect than any other citizen of this nation? So when I listened to that, the first thing I thought was, so do these people, it, there's just this assumption that they don't have any self-interest at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, oh, well, these are, these are upstanding people who are dedicated to their job and blah, 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 blah. It's like, yeah, like you kind of forget the fact that these are they're still people. Like yeah. they have their own interests involved, and you know that that yeah. sway is which way they go. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, yeah. This guy Chiramella, or however you say his name, that they think is the original leaker, yeah. um, registered Democrat, worked closely with John Brennan and and uh, Joe Biden, and you know so on. Yeah. Um, yeah, like this idea that the you know that they're just servants of the public. That's yeah. that's all that they're there to do is just to serve. It like it made me uh, it made me laugh. Uh, Dave Smith had on one of his podcasts, part of the problem last week, um, said something about this idea that you know government employees are just servants of just the public. Just serving the people. And he is yeah. like, a, if you think that um, that. Uh, Hillary Clinton is mad about losing the election because she's deprived of the opportunity to just serve, serve the public. Then, you know, I don't know. Like, that it didn't have anything to do with what she's, you know, this power or influence yeah, or right. r- ruling Ruler, over others. Yeah, yeah. Um, this authority that it was only because she really, really wanted, wanted to, to serve. serve. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, then, uh, you know, you're yeah. you're lost anyway. You're, you're too uh, already stuck in the statist kind that, of paradigm. Exactly. Um, and the thing that really just I, like I laughed but, out loud. And nobody believes that. I mean, nobody believes that. That's why Hillary Clinton wants to be president. It's because she wants to serve. Yeah. Like, nobody believes that. And that's the thing is that when you start talking about specific people, nobody believes that. Yeah. But there's this idea that in general that, that, that that's the case. That, yeah. Well, that, especially you know, when you're talking friends. about behind the scenes people. Mm-hmm. So like, and that's what this is. is yeah. The shadow government. They're behind the scenes, and they have our best interest involved. Yeah. The background of this whole episode is going to phone going to be going off <laughs> yeah um, my bad i muted it <laughs> um the uh the thing that that mclaughlin said i may be pronouncing his name wrong i think it's mclaughlin but anyway I think that's right. um 
that he said, and I laughed out loud when I heard him say it. He's, he's you know, he's talking about these intelligence uh, people and um, said, you know, and talking about the CIA specifically. Yeah. And he says, again, quote, um, they're institutionally committed to objectivity and telling the truth. <laughs> I know, exactly. That's yeah. that's the correct reaction. Is that that's the most absurd thing you've ever heard? The CIA is. CIA is absolutely <laughs> committed to telling the truth. And I thought about um, oh, so many examples. Yeah, Pompeo, uh, Mike Pompeo, who's another yeah. former CIA director. Yeah, um, he was given a speech. Uh, it was like a, or maybe it was a Q and A at some college or something. I can't remember. This is like a year, maybe even two years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, and you know he was a West Point grad. Okay, I um, that. so he he was talking about uh, that you know the motto at West Point is I will not lie, cheat, or steal. Yeah. And he says you know I, I was I'm going to quote again. Okay, uh, he said uh, <laughs> quote I was a CIA director. We lied, we cheated, we stole. We had entire training courses. <laughs> and I believe that. I yeah. expect no less from the CIA. I mean I don't. I mean that's what they are. Yeah. I mean. And so the idea that, and essentially what McLaughlin was saying is that um, that they were trying to defend the republic by removing this dangerous president, yeah. and that's not their job. No, absolutely. Well, it's not their job in this country. Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, I would say that's not their job in general. But well, <laughs> you're, you're, I mean, what else have they ever done? Yeah, I that's mean, true. Like uh, that's that seems to be their central. This is what they're good at, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think that if. If you're okay, regardless of what you think of Donald Trump, yeah. um, that you should consider what it means that the intelligence community might decide that the duly elected president of the United States, the, the person that the people elected, yeah. um, isn't the person that should be in that office and can work to remove that person. Exactly. Um, and see how you feel about a bunch of unelected bureaucrats Making uh, those type of decisions. Exactly. Deciding who should really be in charge and whose policies should be followed. Because that was another thing. This guy, Vindman, yeah. um, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, that, that testified this week, okay. um, he said something in the in the testimony that they released. Yeah. He said something al- along the lines of uh, that, um, you know, that essentially that the president was working against the policies that the foreign policy establishment felt were the right policies. And, and so he was doing what he could to prevent the change in policy. Again, well, that's not his job. And by the way, that's, I don't doubt for a minute that Trump is doing that. And mm-hmm. guess what? The people elected him to do that. Yeah. He ran on that. Yeah. Like that's not, it's not like he's doing something he didn't run on. Mm-hmm. Like this is what the people put him in there to do. Yeah, exactly. He was very clear during the campaign yeah. that he wanted to be friends with Russia. Yeah. And I want us to be friends with Russia too, because between the U S and Russia, that's 90% of the nuclear weapons on this planet. Exactly. Like, do we really want to be enemies with these people? Yeah. Besides he was always talking about like his real enemy was China. Yeah. Um, it, it, like that was clear. I think we ought to be friendly with China too, but yeah. uh, at the very least he was, promoting this idea of being friendly with Russia so that we don't force Russia and China into an alliance with each other. Yeah, because that's the worst thing that could happen for yeah. us. And so, you know, we're going around and we're overthrowing governments and and being the bully all over the planet. Meanwhile, like Putin actually has been making friends yeah. here, there, and everywhere. Yeah. Like they're going oh, and yeah. negotiating places. Like he's making friends and we're overthrowing governments. And in the long run, who do you think is going to win? Exactly. Yeah. Um, now the person, we're, we're the person a, with the most friends is going to be the person holding the cards. Yeah. Uh, the the big dog can lose to the eight smaller dogs. Yeah. Um, exactly. So yeah. you know, just keep that in mind. And but that's the main thing, right? Is that this idea that Trump was elected running on this idea of what he's trying to do? Uh, and Ukraine actually said, um, like, there was some uh, article from that came out of Ukraine that they had. Uh, done what they could to influence the election away from Donald Trump because he was talking about detente with Russia and uh, letting Russia keep the Crimea. Yeah. And I don't know why we would even try to do anything about that. Like Crimea was technically part of Ukraine, but it was one of these things where it was like, uh, was it Khrushchev or somebody way back when, like in, you know, some kind of, you know, drunken idea gave... (sighs) gifted Crimea to Ukraine and it was it was during the time of the Soviet Union so it didn't matter it was like a completely meaningless gift yeah. it was just to you know placate somebody or something yeah. and um so the Crimea is primarily ethnically russian yeah. and they were 
plenty happy when Russia came in. Like it was a this was a bloodless coup. This was a bloodless <laughs> takeover. Yeah. Um, they came into Crimea, and the Crimeans were like, "Oh, thank goodness!" Yeah, yeah. for the most part. <laughs> um, so it's not like that they had to fight for the Crimea, yeah. and it, like the real disputed region in Ukraine is the Donbass region. And mm. it, again, the reason it's disputed is because Ukraine claims it, but it's mostly ethnically Russian. Yeah. Um, so. so they uh, con- most of them considered themselves. Russian Russia. anyway. Yeah. And that's why it's in dispute. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're in a little history and... <laughs> yeah. Like, the the idea, though, that the foreign policy establishment, you know, which is essentially a bunch of neocons at this point. Yeah. And neoliberals, and there's not really much difference between the two. The idea is still the same. Yeah. Um, are, are the people that are the foreign policy establishment. And this is a bunch of unelected yep. career bureaucrats who have decided that this is the way things are, and the president got elected to change those things, and they're doing everything in their power to prevent that from happening. Yeah, and they have from day one. Yeah. I mean, because all this is, is it's it's just more of the same. The, just like the, um, ah, with what's this, with the Mueller report. This yeah. is Mueller report 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> is all First this it was is. Russia, then it was Ukraine. It's like, there's yeah. no, there's no getting out from behind this, and, um, and they're going to continue to attack Trump on this stuff for yeah. as long as he's in office. Yeah. yeah. And when I, he I wins think a second term, it's going to be the same way. Yeah. It'll be more of the same. And I think unless there's a real economic collapse, he's going to win a second term. Yeah. And pressing an impeachment isn't going to help their position either. No. All that does is rally the base. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's all that does for Trump. <clears throat> and when you jump from one thing to another, and as this information starts to get out and people realize that there's not a lot there. Yeah. Um, that you have to make a bunch of inferences uh, about what was said, what was meant by what was said. You can't yeah. take any of it literally. Yeah. Then, you know, they're the people that hate Trump are, they're going to hate Trump no matter what. They're going to yeah. be opposed to him. But people that are on the fence. But the people in the middle are the <laughs> ones that are going to swap. Because, yeah. they, because they're going to realize pretty quick that there's just, just nothing there. Yeah. Unless there's something there we don't know about. <clears throat> but there's been no evidence that that's the case. Yeah. And there could be, but they told us that there were going to be a bunch of indictments at the end of the Mueller report. And there were none. We've heard the story before. Uh, yeah. I mean, we have. Yeah. You know. Um, so this is just a play by the Democrats to keep this in the public yep. um, in order to try and, you know, rally support against Trump. And here's the, the real problem that they have in an election is that the only thing that they're running on is not that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And like, that doesn't get people excited. People don't come out to vote for not that guy. <laughs> people yep. came out to vote for make America great again. Yeah, they did. Um, people don't come out to vote for, well, I'm not him. Well, I still think that there's somebody else who's going to end up getting in the race because I just I don't I don't see Elizabeth Warren being the nominee, and right now that's the direction it's heading. But I, I'm so looking forward to debates between Donald Trump and either <laughs> Elizabeth Warren or Joe Biden. Like oh. that will just be a comedy. Wow, well, I'm telling you, if it's Warren, that's going to be insane. Yeah, <laughs> she's just not very charismatic. No. Um, and and he will just devour her. He will call her po- Pocahontas yeah. all day, every day, and it will just be insane. Um, so uh, let's let's try and shift Steer gears a little, another direction. A little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess maybe like talking about government incompetence, or maybe talking about corruption. We'll just we'll we'll push the corruption thing a little bit longer, and we'll talk about government incompetence. All right. Um. Because I think I got a good segue there. Uh, So I read this article uh, about Ring doorbells. Now, Ring was acquired by Amazon for like a billion dollars a year ago or something like that. Okay. Um, And Ring doorbells are really popular, right? Yes, they are. They're all over the place. Me and you know firsthand how popular they are from going door to door. Oh, yeah. Half the doorbells we rang were Ring doorbells. Yeah, that's that's true. (laughs) So. Um, I had forgotten about that. I was trying oh. to push it out of my mind uh, <laughs> like all that time. Um, yeah. Well, uh, there uh, there was an article out a um, month or so ago uh, talking about uh, Ring's um, contracts with various law enforcement agencies. Okay. All right. So, um, the and it doesn't sound like a lot, but this is a this is not this is not a good start from my perspective. They yeah. have. Um, more than 400 contracts with uh, law enforcement agencies out of about 18,000 
total law enforcement okay. uh, agencies in this country, which yeah. is kind of frightening in and of itself. But you're talking right. about all these local police. Well, I was going to say, these are all right. local municipalities, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the agreement is that if there is a crime or a suspected crime in an area, um, that they will send out messages to, I, I think it's mostly related to this neighborhood app yeah. that they have. Um, but uh, they'll send messages out, emails out to all the people within a certain radius of where the crime is supposedly committed, um, hmm. asking them if they will share their ring doorbell video with local law enforcement. Yeah. Um, now, the good news on this is that uh, so far in this experiment, people have mostly ignored them. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, so as long as I don't so much have a problem as long as they're getting the person who owns the ring in their house, they're getting their permission, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. But all right, so here's the deal with that, though. It's essentially it's a way around the Fourth Amendment. This is yeah. the scary part of this. Okay. It, it's a way to ignore the Fourth Amendment because if they if they request the uh, video and it's voluntary voluntarily provided to them, there's no yeah. warrant necessary. Yeah. But it gives them this opportunity to do all this phishing stuff. Yeah. And like, um, and just start looking around to try and find a crime, find stuff, um, or so we're not we're follow talk, a we're person. Not, we're not talking about reported crimes then. Well, so, uh, maybe, see, my, maybe my not. My assumption the, was was something happened across the street, and so law enforcement's like, "Hey, can we get this video of what happened across the street?" And well, then sure. You give them permission, yay or nay? Yeah, I mean that's the idea. Yeah, but are, are there any? Any, is there anything to ensure that that's what happened? Well, no. I mean, do they have to f- provide a case report to Ring? No, that's not going to yeah. be part of it, right? No. Like, so they can yeah. just start asking for stuff. No. Um, and it's, you know, it's another one of these situations that we talk about with this kind of positive enforcement yeah. thing. Um, where it, it creates confrontations. Yeah. Like they're going, going out looking for crime. Looking for crime when yeah. there's plenty around the benches. <laughs> yeah. And it gives the opportunity to investigate people, not crime. Yeah. But here's the other scary part. Um, so, all right. Well, let me throw in this bit too. Uh, like in the article specifically, they were talking about Fort Lauderdale PD because that's where they were doing all these studies on how people were reacting to it. Yeah. Um, and uh, the Fort Lauderdale Police Department helped install. Uh, ring doorbells at like lots of people's houses um, after raffling off a uh, ring, you know, the ring system at things and giving them away. Let's give them so, away. So, yeah, the law enforcement's like, here, just have this ring doorbell. We'll <laughs> yeah. help you put it in. Yeah. And so, like, it kind of makes you a little I suspicious would, to begin yeah, with, right? There, there's no way I'd approve that. Not for my house. If I want that, I'll go buy it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and Ring has gone out of their way. Like, there's apparently there's stuff in these contracts about how they refer to the system and so forth. Yeah. Um, and they, uh, so Ring has forbidden law enforcement from re- referring to the videos as, quote, surveillance. Yeah. Um, because it could, uh, and this is actually a quote from one of them, right. it could flag user privacy concerns. <laughs> Yeah, Wonder I guess why. it should, yeah. Um, and remember, Amazon is also one of the leading developers of the law enforcement's facial recognition software. Um, now, right. they probably acquired Ring Doorbells because it gives them a whole bunch of data to work with yeah. for this facial recognition stuff. Probably. Um, and so just think about that, too. Like, it, yeah. this this is not your private video yeah. uh, coming from your front door. Like, yeah. It's, Amazon is almost certainly using it. Oh, yeah. Um, but some, uh, the other scary part of this, like the flip side, besides the idea of just them, like, you know, for example, I, I send a, a nasty letter arguing about some foreign intervention to Bradley Burns' office. Yeah. Because that's never <laughs> because, happened. Because you do that, like, um, once a week. <laughs> <laughs> not once a week. Uh, <laughs> and so they know my address because I have to put it in. Yeah. When I send them anything so that he knows I'm a constituent, right? Exactly. So anytime I submit yeah. anything to them, I have to put my address so that they know whether they can ignore me or not, essentially. Yeah. Um, so they know my address. Yeah. Well, maybe they just start, you know, uh, requesting information yeah. um, from this area so that they can track my movements. Yeah, see what right? see what you're up to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you have that to, to be concerned about. And I just don't have faith in the government, especially after all this corruption talk, yeah. uh, of them doing the right thing all the time. They're only using it when there's actual crime that was committed and you know that or reported, whatever. Yeah. Um, 
And then the other side of this, though, was that some of the cities that they contracted with uh, requested the name and address info for all the the Ring owners. Yeah. Um, and hmm. uh, Ring indicated that they were willing to provide that information. <laughs> yeah. So but, here's the other side of it, too, is like that, like I said, that they haven't gotten good responses. So they yeah. keep requesting these videos and people aren't providing Just them. Just not giving them, yeah. Well, now, potentially, law enforcement can tell who refused to provide videos to them. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And does that now make you suspicious? Yep. Now they're retaliated against you. <coughs> Excuse me. So I see a lot of problems with this, and I don't know how far it'll progress. There's certainly some. Um, well, it will. I'll tell you, it will. It will continue to progress because what happens in a situation like this, you can't have a potential tool for law enforcement to use sitting there like that, and them not find a way. I mean, it may take another ten years or so, but at some point, law enforcement will get their full hands on this, and it wouldn't surprise me a bit. If it gets to the point where you don't own the video anymore. Well, you don't own the video now, I'm pretty sure. Well, yeah, exactly. And so all it takes is for them to flip Amazon to turn just to continuously turn it over Mm -hmm. without your permission. And these kind of big uh, Internet companies have done favors for governments all over the world. Yeah. And there's no reason to think it'll be any different here, mm-hmm. um, especially if, like you say, where you don't actually own the video anyway, yeah. where where Amazon owns the video. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you have no control over what they do with it anyway. Mm-hmm. I mean, presumably, they would still have to get a warrant. Yeah. From, but we from saw. You? I mean, but we saw Verizon, uh, you know, years ago didn't care that there was yeah. no warrants when they blanket, were providing. Well, they, they yeah. were providing like blanket oh, warrant. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you want to call that a warrant, uh, we we that's not I a got warrant. a warrant for every cell phone conversation you have, yeah, <laughs> like, or text message you have. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that that's not fair. So if they're already, if you know, the federal government is already collecting all of your user data. Um, all the emails that are being sent back and forth, all the text messages that are being sent back and forth, all the phone calls that are being sent back and forth. Um, you know, how is this going to be any different? Yeah, it won't be. Uh, and I, like I say, it, it, I'm glad to hear it hasn't already happened. Well, it might have. I mean, I, I think know. specifically NSA probably has all this information because it is sent over the yeah. over the net. Oh, I'm sure. And like everything that moves across the net, as I understand it, is at this point it's essentially is captured by the NSA. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so. you know maybe that's tinfoil hat stuff, but I don't think so. I don't. I don't know. I mean, it, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me a bit. Um, and uh, so the the other thing that it does is it, and this is just kind of typical of how things are going because you know um, media doesn't go out and investigate stuff anymore. They're they're not real. Inve- there are some still, but very there's deep. very little investigative yeah. journalism anymore. What happens is that the journalists go out to Twitter. And they look and see what people are saying about things, or looking for <laughs> videos of people that were there, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, this is the same kind of thing for law enforcement. Like, oh well, I don't have to go out and investigate any crime. We'll just pull a whole bunch of videos. We'll look through that stuff. That that yeah. way, I, I can keep sitting here at my desk and eating my donuts, and yeah. you know, exactly, not have to do any legwork. Not have to go well. actually physically go check this out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's you know. This kind of reliance on and so how do how do we fix it? Like we move away from government law enforcement. Yeah. Um, and this is one of those this is one of those th- crazy things libertarians say we could. Nah, I was gonna uh, say we, we could have saved. We that got a segment another. coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think this is a good place to to talk about it because um, the idea this is one of those things that when you say well you privatize law enforcement people that. Even libertarians, a lot of times, are like, "Well, you know, you can't really can't do that. Can't like, really do that." Yeah. Like, first off, we already do. There's private security Everywhere. now, yeah. Um, and the reason there's private security is because it's more reliable, yeah, than well, and public it, security. And it's focused on your your area, yeah. Like, so if if you hire private security for your hotel or whatever mm-hmm. the case may be, mm-hmm. they're dedicated to protecting your property, right? Not. They're not spread so thin that they're not protecting, that they're just kind of out writing speeding tickets and crap. Yeah. You know? So if we take a step back from from law enforcement specifically to other public services, we've got a good example right now with all these fires that are going on in California. Yeah. So, uh, and 
and this is a this is an example of like one of the models that libertarians have proposed for law enforcement, which is this idea that well maybe insurance would start purchasing, uh, you know, using your premiums that they yeah. charge to um, to hire security to protect the various properties. Well, yeah. um, what's happening out in California now is that. Uh, some of the insurance companies on their, I mean, right now it's on their like really expensive policies. People can yeah. um, pay extra and the insurance companies are hiring um, private firefighters. Yeah. And the private firefighters are going out and they're, they're rescuing specific properties or they're, you know, protecting, protecting. Yeah. specific properties. Um, and uh, then this is somehow like really, um, a terrible thing according to the actual public services yeah. and but they are coordinating with the public fire departments and so yeah. forth it's not like um, they're rogue agents just riding around in a fire truck <laughs> yeah yeah uh now the police were saying well you know the real problem is if they get into trouble then we have to go out there and help them and that takes resources away from other things right. it's like it takes resources away from other things to go do something that you weren't should be doing anyway. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. who else is protecting this? Well, yeah, because the, the, that's just a crazy thought in general. Because the whole idea that well, these people are over here fighting this fire and they've gotten in trouble. Like if it was your own firefighters, you go help them, right? Right. Like so, what's the difference? Yeah. Like they're still firefighters. Like yeah. they're still out there fighting a fire. Yeah. Whether or not they're being paid to do it in a specific place should be irrelevant. Mm-hmm. The fact that they're even there puts more firefighters on the ground. Exactly. They're yeah. helping out your public service because yeah. your public service can't provide enough coverage. Exactly. So they're out there providing more coverage. Yeah. Um, and the people that they're helping are paying for it. Yeah. yeah. So who cares? Yeah. Like, um, how is this a bad thing? <laughs> exactly. And so, of course, you know, the police guys were like, well, they'll go out there and they'll protect a specific property while the property next door burns down. Well, then I was listening to some interviews with some of these private firefighters. And they're yeah. like, well, that's not. That's not the case. Yeah. Um, if the house next door is burning, it's a threat to the house that we're protecting. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll protect the, the neighbor's houses and so forth. What they're yeah. saying is that they, they won't go blocks over to help some random yeah. house, you know. Yeah. Because um, they're focused on the house that they're being paid to protect. But, you know, what if that person purchased their services? They would. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it brings up some other things. Like, this is another one of those things that it, probably the problem is uh, not, I mean, it's exacerbated by government interference anyway. Like yeah. the whole wildfire problem. Yeah. Um, because this isn't something new. And as much as they want to blame it on climate change, uh, California has been on fire for its entire history pretty much. <laughs> yeah. um, this is just part of the natural ecosystem, these these fires. And all all these ecosystems developed through fire. Yeah. Um, so they, they can recover from them. And so yeah. you, you have all these problems because um, they are trying to prevent fires anyway. So they did fire suppression for uh, – initially they did fire suppression, right? Yeah. And so they would go out there and they'd put out these fires just as quickly – any fire. Put them out just as quickly as they could. Yeah. And so then all this uh, – you know, all these little – Little trees and detritus and shrubs and leaf litter and whatever isn't burning off. It's so, building up. Yeah. So next year when you have a fire, it's a little bit harder to stop because there's more fuel. Yeah. And so you stop it again and now there's more fuel for the next year. And it, yeah. it keeps building like this. So and then it they sounds say, like the answer would be like controlled burns. Well, they did that for a while too. They were like, yeah. oh, okay, well, maybe these low intensity fires are actually good for the environment because they burn off this this stuff on the ground burn yeah. off all this fuel on the ground and that that's fine so what we'll do is we'll do controlled burns yeah um and uh and i mean they do that around here yeah well uh, you don't have as we, we have such we a high have, humidity yeah we don't have the problem but i'm yeah. just saying like but we do have controlled burns i see it yeah. all the time yeah um and so uh then they were saying okay well you know we'll just allow these low intensity fires and we'll control them and and we'll just burn them off in certain places and you know we'll keep all the big stuff around yeah um but then they started having more trouble with these high intensity fires where you know these hundreds of feet of flame you know yeah. burning down everything and um so they were like okay well this is what we'll do and the, and <laughs> here's the here's the scandal part of it the scam uh-huh. of it yeah. uh, as far as i'm concerned anyway so the um the land management agencies were getting extra money from the government uh, to go out there and mark trees to do what they called a th- you know thinning the forests. Yeah. And so they would go out and they'd mark trees and they'd bring loggers in to cut down specific trees to try and you know again 
create less fuel and have them pick up logs that are laying over and old dead trees and clean up the woods. Yeah. Things like that. Right. Yeah. To try and prevent these high intensity fires and still allow the low intensity fires to burn. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, the logging companies are making off well, and the, these land management agencies, they're taking money from the government to go out and, and you know, inspect and mark trees and what have you and figure out where they need to bring the loggers in to do this stuff. Yeah. And then they're selling off the logs to the loggers, so they're using that <laughs> money then to pad their own uh, accounts. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but the, the truth of it is that the high intensity fires are part of it too. Yeah. And so, and these old growth trees and so forth that they were selling off because they fetch a high price. Yeah. Um, are, uh, are kind of fire resistant. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the thinning wasn't really helping things. And it was, you know, it was creating biodiversity problems because the, because when these high intensity fires happen, yeah. um, they burn off these big trees and, you know, there's logs laying over and like a whole bunch of stuff. Well, actually those areas within a, a year or two yeah. are the most biodiverse areas in these forests. Really? Um, yeah, because once they burn off all this high stuff, all the little stuff could start to grow. So you get a bunch of flowering plants in there and it draws in the insects yeah. and then the insects draw in the birds and then, the, you know, and so they have all, all this stuff. on itself. Yeah, and these old growth trees that are dead that they were selling off, um, but these old growth trees that are still standing because they they can survive the fire, yeah. uh, they provide really good habitat, like uh, homes essentially for you know various kinds of birds and rodents and you know all these kind of things. So yeah. it, this is actually like a really important part of the the cycle of life <laughs> out there that the government has been in there trying to prevent over and over again, yeah. and the more they prevent it. Um, from happening happening in the natural way, the more intense these things become when they when they actually get ignited. When they, yeah, when something happens. The other thing that I read uh, that I found not surprising but really interesting yeah. um, was that all of the uh, all of what they were doing to try and control um, various forested areas in terms of uh, removing fuel and thinning the forest and so forth, yeah. um, like less than 5% of it was anywhere near residential areas. They're like really? going out into the middle of nowhere and doing this. <laughs> so, Where the fires wouldn't hurt anybody anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And so it seems like you could do a much better job because you can actually like create breaks yeah. that uh, that inhibit the... There are solid breaks. Yeah, that inhibit these fires burning through these residential areas. Yeah. If you had concentrated all that stuff like within um, a few hundred yards of residential areas, you yeah. probably could have prevented most of these fires from really threatening from, any residences. Yeah, exactly. But no, they were just out in the middle of nowhere doing this. <laughs> That's your government for you, man. Yeah. Um, and then they then they sit back and they complain about um, how Climate these private change. firefighters. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. If you <laughs> if you really want to get the uh, the tinfoil hat on. Um, is, you know, this idea of climate change is the thing that you can use to get people to get together and, and say, we need government to do something about this. Like, yep. this is such a big problem that only government can fix this problem. Yeah. And so we, we hand over all this authority and liberty to the government so that they can do what they can to save us. Yeah. But it's a, it's a problem of their own making and it doesn't have anything to do with climate change. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. This is an old problem. I yeah. mean, California was burning down before the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. It's just part of part of life out just there. Just how it is, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, and they're being more intense or bigger or whatever. It doesn't have to do with climate change. It has to do with their their interventions to try and prevent with it in how, the first place. How they've handled things, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and... I'm not feeling well, so I'm hoping that we can kind of stop there. Yeah, I'm about ready to wrap up myself, man. <laughs> okay. I'm just kind of beat in general. Um, so we we put in a good amount of time here, so I, I don't feel like I robbed you guys out there. Yeah. Um, and uh, But I, I'm like, I'm sweating now, and I really want to get up and get out of here. <laughs> um, so I uh, hope you enjoyed it anyway. Um, yeah. Learn something. Look up that stuff about uh, the fi how wildfires really work. And, yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting anyway. Yeah. And, um, well, I, and I've always heard that, that a big part of the deal with the fires in California was just mismanagement of mm -hmm. the wildlife in general. Yeah. So, I mean, you, that just kind of plays right on into what that. So. Yeah. Well, and it fits in perfectly with the state with the most intrusive government, right? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even consider that, but yeah. you're right. Yeah. Um, 
So, uh, you know, hopefully they get a handle on it. I, it's not that I don't care. Like, I, I yeah. think it, it sucks that people are losing these properties. Yeah. Um, well, and the thing I saw recently is they can't get them insured now. Like, they, they've, like, pulled all of this coverage away. And, like, so people have these multi thousands and thousands of dollar houses and they can't even get insurance on them yeah like and they're so and they have to have it for their mortgages and stuff like it's crazy it's a well, mess i mean that's what happened here too with hurricanes I after was, the government got involved exactly well and that's when i was when i was hearing about that report about the insurance that's exactly what i it paralleled it to was the mm-hmm. same thing with us like hurricane you know? coverage here is insanely expensive at yeah. this point yeah. and you know truthfully the only way you can get it is through the government at this yeah, point. At this like there's, point, yeah. there's no other way. I mean, like you can do wind stuff, but yeah, it's not the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and that was the idea with the law enforcement thing too. Um, is that you know insurance companies would rather pay to secure the property than have to pay to to replace yeah. things. And it's the same thing with these fire departments yeah. and or the, the private firefighters and the insurance companies. It's yeah. cheaper for the insurance company to pay those guys to go out there and protect those multi-million dollar homes yep. than it is to try and replace that multi-million dollar home. Exactly. And this is a fine model. Yeah. And and then also, like this is an important point. I said we're going to end this, but we're... <laughs> <laughs> Here we go again. Yeah. Um, that, that is... Uh, what's the important point, Gary? Oh, I don't know. I got I distracted myself. <laughs> you, you didn't send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, is that they're accountable. Oh, yeah. Because uh, we talked about it on, on this program in the past. Uh, oh, law yes, enforcement yes. Does, is not required to help you. And they're not accountable to anybody. And that's a good point I hadn't mm-hmm. considered, especially with the private firefighters. And even if you use private security and stuff, mm-hmm. like they are accountable. Yeah. Like, I mean, if, if you're paying them to do a job, they've been paid to do a job. Yeah. And if they don't, follow through with that then there's repercussions for that so there's all the more incentive for them to do it right yeah and if you're thinking how could i afford this kind of thing um you know just think about how much more money you'd have if you weren't paying taxes for the government to not help you well that's just it and that's the other thing you have to consider when it with something like this is like yeah you'd you'd be paying for the services you want and Mm -hmm. not for and you wouldn't be paying for the ones you don't yeah and it's simple as that i mean if you can protect your house by yourself like Mm -hmm. Most of us here in Alabama can. Yeah. <laughs> then maybe you don't need to hire yeah. private security. I've seen I've seen house fires plenty of times where uh, old man was standing out in front with his garden hose, yeah. just like spraying <laughs> that thing down, and neighbors were coming running up with buckets. I mean, like yeah. it's it's yeah. not unusual. I mean, here. that's the that's the true first responders right there. Yeah. Like you talk about the first responders, that's the the guy next door is the first responder. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, so the the accountability is an is an important part of it, and you know they, if you're paying for that, and so at first probably these things would only be the high end um, yeah. policies. I mean yeah. it's certainly the case right now, yeah. but as as they hire more and more of these people, like there's a economy of scale, yeah. and so like you pilot the program, you get the infrastructure in place, it becomes cheaper to offer it. So then, you know, instead of just the, well, the, the more, ultra the wealthy. The more people you pull in, the more it feeds off itself anyway. It right. hits a point where it's like, okay, well, now that we've scaled it up, mm-hmm. we need to get more policyholders. So you start providing more to more people. And, yeah. And this is and how market solutions work is that, you know, maybe initially it's only available to the ultra wealthy. Yeah. And as you get more of them on board and they're essentially providing the investment capital yeah. for the company to expand and improve its its systems and, and lower costs. Yep. Um, and then it's not just the ultra wealthy, it's the rich too. Yeah. And that's a whole bunch more money that comes pouring in to help them develop the systems. Yep. And then after some time, it's the middle class that has access to it too. Yeah. And then next thing you know, everybody can afford it. Exactly. Exactly. So um, market always has the answer. It may not be as quick as you want, but it's... But it's there. And it's more efficient. Yeah. Oh, every time. Yeah. Every time. There's more accountability, just mm-hmm. like you had said. Um, so. so we'll we'll definitely end it there. Uh, and this time for real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, um, follow us on Facebook and uh, subscribe on iTunes. And, of course, you can always check our website at thelibertymike.com. Um, all, all the stuff ends up there at some point. Yeah. Actually, it ends up there first. You're, you're, <laughs> yeah. That's the first place it goes. It's true. Um, and uh, 
like and share and, um, you know, tell us, tell your friends about us and whatever. Um, we'd like to get it out there, obviously, to more and more people. And as usual, if you have any questions, you can send them to me. Uh, I'm Michael at the Liberty Mike. Um, there is a Larry at the Liberty Mike.com also. Yeah. I don't think he checks it. I don't know that I even have <laughs> access to it. Maybe. I don't know. I haven't checked it for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, we can fix that some other time. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. <laughs> and, uh, and join us next time when we finally get this right. Uh, in the meantime, try and stay free. Train how you fight. Ciao. Later.